Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He asked, Who are you, Lord? The reply came, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless because they heard voice, but saw no one. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. So they led him by hand and brought him into Damascus. For three days he was without sight, and neither ate nor drank. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of each and every one of our hearts be pleasing to you and acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I looked down and my hands were shaking. My stomach was churning. My tie felt a little too tight. And I was sweating. 
I looked down, trying to get my feet to move through the doorway, but couldn't quite get them to budge. I looked down the long marble hallway filled with paintings of important people, and looked forward once again. I felt the weight of the briefcase I was holding in my right hand, filled with statistics and expert analysis. And I was nervous about this meeting I was going to because I had a feeling it probably wouldn't go like I hoped that it would. It was the first time I had ever done anything like this before. I was lobbying. I was working with Bread for the World. I was doing a fellowship in Washington, D.C. And I was about to confront my congressional representative on his voting record. You see, he had run as a Christian candidate, yet in every place that he had an opportunity, he had voted against legislation that would help poor and hungry people around the world. And so, I went in. I finally worked up the courage to get through the doorway, and I asked to speak to my representative. He was, of course, not there. So I met with one of his staff members instead, who listened patiently as I handed him the statistics, as I talked about how I was there because of my faith, and how I thought my faith told me that I needed to support those who were the least of these. He smiled, and he said he would give the information to the representative, and it didn't make much difference. He continued to vote the exact same way. I learned that day that Conversion is hard, especially if you're in a position of power. It's hard to change your stances on important issues. I was thinking about that this week as I was reading the story of Paul's conversion on the road to Damascus. You see, he was in a position of power. And in one of those ironies of history, ended up joining the very sect that he had been persecuting. What a powerful story this is, perhaps one of the most powerful in the entire Bible. In fact, I think it's pretty safe to say if it weren't for Paul's conversion, we might not be sitting here today. Or at least, Christianity would look a whole lot different. He did more to spread Christianity than anyone else in the early church, save Jesus himself. What a powerful story, Paul's conversion. We find the story in the book of Acts, which, as you likely know, was almost certainly written as by the same person who wrote the Gospel of Luke. It's a sort of part one and part two of the same story. Luke was really inspired by Paul's theology, and he wrote decades later than Paul did, and so he's telling Paul's story. Well, we meet him as Saul of Tarsus in the book of Acts, and we find out that he is a Pharisee, that he is a Roman citizen, and that he is a zealous persecutor of the church. A word which used in the Bible almost always means that a person has a violent enthusiasm for their faith. And that is certainly Saul's case. He is standing, the first time we meet him, over the coats of the people who are stoning Stephen. Stephen was a deacon and likely the church's first martyr, and he was being stoned for blasphemy. I'm glad that that's no longer something we do, at least in the United States, with the number of times that I have been called blasphemous in my life. But Saul apparently approves of this. If we can trust Acts, he goes house to house, taking out women and men, binding them, taking to them to Jerusalem for trial, and then putting them to death by stoning. A very sad state of affairs. Saul was a zealous persecutor of the church. I think when we hear this story, it's important for us to keep modern Judaism 
out of stories like this. When we hear stories about, about the Jews or about violence that, uh, that is happening in the ancient world, I think that's been a mistake of many Christians throughout time, that they have seen contemporary Judaism and read that back into these stories. I think it's important that as we talk about these things, we understand them within their original historical context. This is a debate within a single religious group. Jesus and his disciples, from the day they were born until the day that they died, considered themselves to be Jewish. In fact, Jesus' disciples argued that if people were going to follow Jesus, they had to convert to Judaism. It was only Paul who later opened this up to everyone and said that you didn't have to become a Jew to become a follower of Jesus. So I think that's important, that this is a conversation that happened within a single religious group. Violence broke out from time to time, but it is uh, an argument between those who wanted to reform uh, the tradition and those who didn't. But it's safe to say that Saul was on the side of those who were doing the persecuting, and the followers of Jesus were the ones who were being persecuted. And that's exactly where we find Saul today doing the persecuting. Acts says that he is still breathing threats and planning murder against followers of the way, as the early church was known. And he has already gone and talked to the high priest in Jerusalem. He has gotten letters that he's going to take to the synagogues in Damascus. He's going to deliver them and say if he finds any followers of the way, that he's going to bind them, he's going to take them to Jerusalem, he's going to have them tried and probably stoned. And so he's walking on the road to Damascus with those letters in hand when something unbelievable happens. There's this brilliant light shining forth from heaven. And it's so powerful that it knocks him off his feet. He's surrounded by this light. And he hears a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He says, who is this? And the voice says, Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Now those who are with him hear the voice but can see nothing. And the voice says, stand up and go to Damascus. And so those who are with him help him up and they help him get to Damascus because he has been blinded by the light. He fasts for three days, still blind, and then a follower of Jesus comes and grants him the Holy Spirit, and all of a sudden he can see again, or perhaps can see for the first time. And he joins then the very people that he has been persecuting. He gets baptized, he changes his name from Saul to Paul, and becomes the greatest evangelist that the church has ever known. What an incredible story! And yet the interesting thing is that Paul is the most prolific writer of the New Testament and says almost nothing about his conversion. All we really learn from Paul is that he was a Pharisee, he was zealous in his persecution of the church, and that he believed his message did not have human origins but came from God. Nothing about a bright light, nothing about being knocked off of his feet or hearing a booming voice or being blinded. So I think we probably ought to see the story in the book of Acts as a dramatization of Paul's conversion experience. But how apt it is. He was knocked off of his feet and blinded and granted new vision for what is possible when following Jesus. And we can understand this, can't we? Have there been times for you when you have been knocked off your feet? When you've been going down one road and thought, why am I doing this? What is my life about? 
when you've been knocked off your feet and granted new vision, when you have been blinded by the light, I think we probably all had a few experiences like that every now and again. You know, uh, there was another story at Bread for the World that we liked to tell. It was another representative who had run on the platform of being a Christian candidate and who had also continued to vote against people who were poor and hungry. And his constituents decided to go and meet with him, just as I had done with my representative. And they caught him at his office as he was getting ready to leave and go on a flight. And they must have been pretty convincing because he let them get in the car with him. And they spent every second that they had in that car telling him why, if he was really a Christian, he ought to care about the least of these. And when he got out of the car, not only did he support that piece of legislation, he became bread for the world's biggest supporter. You see, you never know. You never know when you might just get knocked off your feet and be blinded by the light and be granted new vision. That's the way God works. It might happen on the way to the airport. It might happen on the road to Damascus. It might happen in a sanctuary. It might happen at a dinner table with friends who, hear, who tell you words that you desperately need to hear. You just never know. And so today, I pray that God might look into our lives and knock us off our feet every once in a while. I pray that God might just blind us by the light and give us new vision. Amen.